Access, the podcast of OA, located deep within Sector 14845 and powered by the Emerald Light of Will. The podcast of OA is your guide to the Green Lantern universe. Hosted by Lantern Myron Rumsey, the podcast of OA begins now. Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of of the podcast of OA. This is episode number 182, and we've got kind of a big episode with lots of uh, interesting topics to talk about. This time around, we've got some Green Lantern news, and we've got another Know Your Core segment. And then we're going to talk a little bit about, uh, as, as I'm starting to call it, Twittergate, uh, about the Jeff Thorne Twitter history stuff. And uh, then we're going to be talking about uh, the we're going to do a retro review on Green Lantern number six from again early in Jeff Johns' run, and then we've got a whole lot of listener feedback. Joining me on this journey is my good friend and uh, Core's brother, Phil Bova. Phil, my friend, welcome to December of 2020. The end of the year has finally come upon us. Happy holidays and seasons greetings to all fellow Owens. Yes, it's uh, it's going to be an interesting end of the year. I think everybody's going to ring in the new year with a with a, a heightened sense of of delight. I mean, next month's going to be a big month. I mean, you got the <laughs> the inaugurations coming. Uh, Clark turns one. I mean, look at that. I mean, geez, it's already been a year. Wow. I turned forty seven. <laughs> wow. My mom would have turned uh, 74, 75, 74. I just realized we're exactly ten years apart. Yeah, yeah, it's gonna be it's a big it's a big month. December and January are always a a verifiable nightmare on my end. I mean, we got so many birthdays. We got so many fam. My sister's birthday is in January. My two cousins are in January. My dad's is December 29th. I mean, it's like oh my gosh. Wow. <laughs> yes, but uh, I'm glad to be here. Uh, I, um, I'm looking forward to Christmas. I mean, it's not going to be the same without mom this year, but, uh, you know, we're in the holiday spirit. We got all our decorations up and lights and, uh, I'm can't wait for Christmas morning to see Clark's face when he opens all his presents for the first time. And not that it matters cause he's going to want to eat the paper and play with the boxes, but whatever. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he won't remember any of it, but you sure will. No, no. So, uh, yeah, just happy to be here with you, man. And, uh, you know, looking forward to this good discussion tonight. We've got a lot of stuff to talk about. Yeah, yeah. I uh, just a little news. I, uh, I I've shared information about my my birth defect in the past, and mm-hmm. I just got invited to participate in a genetic study with Columbia University, and to be donating some DNA to have evaluated. To see. they're they're looking for commonalities amongst people, and they're really interested in people who are older to gather information and then compare it to uh, the kids that are being born now. And uh, to to give an idea of how rare what I have is uh, there's a whole category of birth defects that fit in this range. And one in about every 4,000 births has this birth defect. Out of that, only eight-tenths of 1% have my version of it. So they're, they're really interested in grabbing my DNA to see whether there's anything odd that uh, that caused that to happen. So uh, not that I'm going to undergo any, I just got to give them some spit really, you know, but I'm, I'm excited to participate and hopefully provide some information that will help kids that are being born with the same birth defect as I am. It's not going to do anything to help me, but it's going to be help, something to help them, I hope. So excited about that. Good. Good news, man. That's good to hear. Yep, yep. So uh, in terms of Green Lantern news, a couple of sad things to, to start out with. I, I hate to start on the downside, but I'd rather start on the downside and add more positive. Uh, we had a couple of deaths that relate to the Green Lantern universe recently. David Lander uh, passed away on December 3rd at the age of 73. Now, depending on how old you are, you may remember David Lander from the TV show Laverne and Shirley. He played Squiggy. Uh, but how does this tie to Green Lantern? He did the voice of Chip in Green Lantern First Flight. He also did some voices in both Superman the Animated Series and Batman the Animated Series. So uh, sad news that he passed away. And then uh, perhaps the model for Hal Jordan, or at least a big inspiration for Hal Jordan, Chuck Yeager passed away on December 7th at the age of 97, uh, a life very well lived. Uh, The gentleman was definitely one of the inspirations for uh, Hal Jordan's role of being a test pilot. And one of the neatest moments, at least for me as a, as a, a big Hal fan, 
is that you know on the pages of DC The New Frontier, the the series by Darwin Cook, Hal got to meet Chuck Yeager on the pages of that book. And I thought it was such a neat moment. It's one of my favorite sections of, of a book ever. Uh, I like when he's uh, when he's talking to the the bartender lady. I think it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, She's like, "What's a young young whippersnapper like you want to meet a guy like him for, or something like that?" Yeah, that was cool. I remember Darwin Cook, and I think it's the commentary track was lamenting the fact that they cut that scene out of the film, uh, the animated movie, and he really wanted that in there. And he, he, I think he said it was his biggest regret about the movie was not getting that moment in there because he thought it was such a big piece and uh i i i shared that panel out on social media just because I, th- I thought it was a nice tie-in to, to green lantern but uh in terms of comics uh, i know you and i have talked a little bit about death metal on and off in the past uh both of us i think are, are buying the books but we haven't really been keeping up with it and this past week was a dark knight's death metal the last stories of the dc universe uh <laughs> these books have to have like some of the longest titles i've I ever seen <laughs> they but, really do all of them are like that yeah 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 um so it was an 80 page book uh it was a nine dollar cover price pretty expensive but it's basically an anthology and it's kind of wrapped in a teen titan story banner or wrapper i should say and Kyle Rayner shows up in the Titans section because he, there was a time when he was on the Titans for a little bit and he you see him interact with Donna Troy ever so in a fleeting moment. But one of the stories that's in this issue, uh, to, to give you an idea, if, if you're not following the event, there's and I, I'm not following it myself, so I'm not really uh, up to date as to what's happening. But apparently this is this, this story, this, this issue takes place the night before the night before the big climactic battle in Death Metal. And uh, or death metal, yeah, Dark Knight's death metal, and so basically, this book is sp- shining the spotlight on certain characters and character families the night before as to how do they spend how they spend it, and so all the Titans are gathered together, and then it cuts away, and the first story is a Hal Jordan story written by Jeff Lemire, and drawn by Raphael Albuquerque, and it, it, just a neat character driven story called Last Nights. Uh, out of the eighty page book, it's about ten pages. And it's Hal, and, and as one would expect, Hal, Hal's last night, what he wants to do is spend it flying. And he's basically sees ghosts everywhere he goes. He goes to Coast City, and there's basically not much of anything left because I guess Darth Knight's de- death metal has really uh, kind of laid waste to a lot of the the multiverse. But Hal encounters someone who I'm not going to – I'm not going to spoil it. But Hal encounters somebody and basically hits his last meeting or potentially last meeting with this individual – the night before this big battle, and they share uh, they share some experiences together in this story, and it's a really well written character piece. And for anybody out there who think that Hal Jordan might be cardboard, um, this wouldn't be a good story to read. Uh, so <laughs> the first the first panels on that were really cool, where he's uh, visiting his father's grave. Yes, yeah, you know he's there in Coast City, and he's surprised that the grave is there. Uh, just a, a a nice story. I, I'm assuming you've read it then. Yeah. Yeah, I have it. Uh, I I really liked it. Uh, you know, if Jeff Lemire was to write Green Lantern, I would not be upset. No, he's he's good. He he does the character justice in this. I'm a, I'm a little a little leery of the artwork. I mean, it's not bad, but it's I've seen a lot lot worse. Yeah, I've seen a lot, a lot worse. I've seen a lot better. Right. <laughs> right. Uh, the other character that joins him, um, I I'm not really fond of of the way that that character's drawn. And there's yeah. some spots where Hal looks really angry more than I would expect him to, but you know, it's it's style, different styles. Yeah, it's a good, it's a, it's an interesting little story. It's it, I don't know if it's worth. Well, I mean, I can't say that because there's a lot of I didn't read all the stories in there because there's a, there's a Wonder Woman story written by uh, Mariko Tamaki. Uh, I read that one, which is pretty good, but um, most of them are pretty decent. But um, you know, but the the Hal Jordan one is really really cool. That's pretty much the only reason I wanted to buy it. Yeah, there's a Gail Simone story about uh, Black Canary and Oliver Queen, which is kind of interesting. Uh, I, it was it was all right. The Aquaman story is interesting. Mm-hmm. It's a, it's a very very prose kind of tale. It's uh, good, and that's got good art too. Yep, yep. Yeah. And, and there's of course the obligatory Batman story, but I it, Batman really isn't the focus. It's more of a uh, Nightwing Batgirl kind of story. Well, but I mean. 
what book don't they put out that doesn't have to have Batman? Right, right, right. Mm-hmm. It, it, it was nice, though, to see that he's really not playing a major role. Well, for, like, once. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I wasn't too keen on the Mark Wade story. I did like the Francis Manipal artwork, but the story, eh, for me. Uh, but you know, if if you if you if you're interested in in the book, it's it's not that it's not worth the nine dollars. But I wouldn't buy it if you were only looking for the Green Lantern story. If you don't like the other characters, or you're not interested in the rest of the DCU, I wouldn't spend nine dollars on it. But well, and it depends on how invested you are in the, the Death Metal. You know, I mean. Like, I've gotten to the point now where I'm kind of wishing that that whole story, like, arc was over. Um, but, I mean, it's a it's a good seg into what's going on with it. I mean, I, I have followed it. I'm a little confused about the whole concept of it. I got the gist of it at this point. But, I mean, again, like anything else, sometimes these stories just have a, a tendency to just take a mind of its own. And, like, there's so many books for death metal out there. And it's like, oh, my gosh. You know, it's like it's it's I think it's over exploited and I feel like it's going on too long. It's I mean it's coming to a close, I know that. But uh I'll be glad when it's over. <laughs> and then we got Future State. Endless Winter though started, which I picked up the first issue of that. I thought it was kinda cool. Um but it reminded me a lot of Final Night, you know, in a way. Right. Which we did about that a, earlier. But um it it we'll see how this goes. It's just another I don't know what I don't, I'm not trying to figure out why they decided to do the death metal thing, and then they got this endless night, and they're going right into future state. It's kind of a it's kind of a weird kind of seg from those three perspectives, but I, I don't I don't know. That's why I'm sitting in St. Louis, Missouri, and not in Burbank. I guess. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I'm kind of in, in the same boat as you. I I mean I understand. I, I think they've just gone overboard with death metal. I I, I just kind of want it to be over with because I'm tired of hearing about it. Uh, and with uh, the, the 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 winter story, eh, it didn't interest me enough to want to pick it up. And uh, future state, uh, you know, we've had so many, you know, futures end part two. I mean, it, it's just how many times have we seen the, the the fate of the DC universe, and it ends up not sticking anyway. So it's hard to get invested in too much. I mean, it might be interesting to see the stories just for story's sake, but. I'm not sure if it's really going to be the continuity of things. And that's kind of the double-edged sword, right? Because if Future State is really the future, then you've kind of lost the dramatic tension for characters that are going to be in Future State because you know know they survive, right? Mm -hmm. Right. And then if that doesn't happen and that's not the future, then what was the point of doing it in the first place other than just to tell what-if stories? Right. I'm I'm not sure what their purpose is with Future State. I don't know. I mean, like, but you and I have talked about it before in the past, and some I've, some of the books that are coming out, I just some of them don't even they just don't look very good. I mean, it just I'm not really interested in the and I mean the, the the Green Lantern one I might pick up just to see what's going on, and we'll have to we're gonna have to do it anyway because you know we're part of this podcast, and I don't want to be biased just because I don't like something that doesn't mean I don't want to talk about it, but um. You know, I'm not going to hold back. If I don't like the story, if I don't like what's going on, I'm, I'm you know, I'm going to be upfront about it. But I'm a little worried about what the franchise is going to do and what's going to happen with Green Lantern moving forward. That's for sure. Yep, yep, I echo that sentiment, and uh, we'll be talking about that in our next segment because I, I felt like that whole that whole thing is worthy of a segment of its own. So right, I can agree. <laughs> yep. So when we come back. You and I will jo- dive deep into the Jeff Thorne Twitter Twittergate controversy. All right. And then we've got a comic book to talk about, and we got some listener feedback. And, of course, we've got Know Your Core. All right. All right, so we'll be right back. Prepare for a spine-tingling, nerve-shattering podcast featuring all your favorite monsters. You won't believe your ears when you listen to Monster Kid Radio. Here your host... Derek M. Cook and his ever-rotating stable of guests discuss your favorite classics and sometimes not-so-classic monster movies. Subscribe to Monster Kid Radio through iTunes or Stitcher or visit monsterkidradio.net before the next weekly episode of Monster Kid Radio. Go through the archives for interviews with Sarah Karloff, Victoria Price, and Joel Hodson. Listen to discussions about movies like Creature from the Black Lagoon, Island of Terror, and King Kong. And don't forget convention coverage from Monster Bash and the H.P. Lovecraft Film Festival, Classic Monsters, Modern Talk, and the head of Rondo Hatton, only on Monster Kid Radio. All 
right, Phil, I'm all liquored up. Let's talk about this. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, well, full disclosure before we before we delve into the the Jeff the Jeff Thorne thing. Um, I'm not really familiar with him all that much. I know he wrote for Marvel. I, I mean, I've never read any of his material before. Let's put it that way. So I'm kind of I'm kind of going into it uh, with a clean palate. However, that said, my palate got cleansed when I started reading into the backstory of Jeff Thorne, which is what we're going to be talking about here on the, on the podcast tonight. So, um, I will say that before, before we delve into this, but I I want you to say what you need to say and then we'll go back and forth and then we'll, we'll deconstruct it. Right, right, right. So, uh, this past week, now you and I recording this on December 10th, uh, Mm -hmm. this past weekend in Brazil, um, Warner brothers had the, the comic con experience in Brazil. And there were different announcements. They showed a new trailer for Wonder Woman, those kind of things. And during that event, they announced that Jeff Thorne and Tom Rainey, uh, writer and artist respectively, would be launching a new Green Lantern series in March. Now, that's since changed to April. So we're, we're talking April now instead. And Thorne was one of the people who was kind of tied to DC's 5G plans. He was one of the names that was kind of attached to that. And and that creative team are the same creative team that's working on the Jon Stewart anchor story that is in the upcoming Future State books. So like you, there are a lot of people, and like me, there are a lot of people who have no familiarity with Thorne's work. So people were like checking his social media to find out, you know, what is he like? What does what he seem to be interested in? Are there any nuggets of, of kernels of... of things that he might have mentioned on his Twitter feed. And so people started looking at his Twitter feed history to see what they could find out. And so they probably did like a Twitter search where they searched his account for anything related to Green Lantern. And it kind of then blew up because people started posting dozens of different tweets that expressed outright disdain and hatred of Hal Jordan, as well as a lot of other characters that he didn't like. And basically it seems like he likes none of the Green Lanterns except for Jon Stewart. And that kind of just started to blow up a little bit on Twitter. And I, I got copied in on it and I hadn't even seen any of it. And I was asked for my comment and I, I responded rather, um, I'll be honest, I responded rather crudely because I thought it was Bantha Poodoo. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> nice. and uh, so I, I, I didn't want to respond to it too much. I wanted to do my own research. So I started looking into myself. And the more I looked, the more disgusted I got. Uh, just because it, it's it's very toxic behavior. Uh, when every time you start talking about something like a character like that, you're putting the characters down. And especially if you're somebody who's a creator. Now, you know, we, we all have our preferences, right? You know, I, we all do. We all have our favorites. But as a creator, you're kind of held to a little bit of a different standard because you're writing books and characters and now that he's writing a green lantern book whose contents we don't really know uh people are looking at his feed saying wow this guy doesn't like green lantern and gc comes right out in one tweet and says he hates hal jordan uh so i, I kind of put together a little bit of a story and i didn't write a whole lot about it i didn't i didn't capture every one of his tweets but i did post the one of him uh saying he hated hal jordan and one where he kind of threw some shade at jeff johns which i thought was rather um Punkish, not professional too. <laughs> yes, yes, and uh, I, I then you know I, I'm pretty active on social media, in different different message forums and you know Reddit, and I don't always comment just because I know the brand the blog of Oa is attached to my name, and if I see something, it almost represents my brand, and and so I draw that line. I, I myself can be professional about <laughs> mixing my personal likes and and what I say publicly, and sometimes I you know I have maybe a controversial opinion or whatever. But over on the CBR boards, it kind of blew up there, and uh, Jeff Thorne posted a, a big long message and basically said you know here's the facts. There's a big difference uh, from speaking as a fan and working as a writer, and I I don't take jobs to to express vendettas against fictional characters. And when and if Hal appears, he'll be the Hal Jordan that, that's been established and will behave the way that DC would like him to be portrayed. Uh, and he says, when I'm a fan, I speak as a fan. When I sit down to write, that stops. And, and basically, he's to me, it's damage control. And then he's trying to say, well, you know, I know I express these opinions personally, but I'm not going to, you know, I won't let that affect my, my writing. Now, one of his tweets, 
he comes out and says when he's asked about characters that no matter how well written they are, you can't put it beside your personal bias. And lo and behold, Hal Jordan is listed there. So, you know, he's kind of contradicting himself a little bit. But anyway, uh, you know, he's talked about I can't really talk about what this book is going to be. Uh, only about five people on the planet know what's coming and none of them are in the fan press. Not one of them. And I responded to him, and, and I wasn't antagonistic. I basically said, you know, you got to understand, fans don't know you. You are an unknown com- commodity to them. And only if only about five people on the planet know what's coming, the rest of them are going to have to judge by what you've said. And whether you've right. said it as a fan or a professional, you've still said it. Mm-hmm. And, and you've upset a lot of fans. And, uh, you know, he, he and I, we didn't go back. And, I don't know. I want to say we went back and forth in a rude way. I mean, it was only a couple of, a couple of messages back and forth. And uh, I basically ended up saying, listen, you know, it's going to be what it's going to be. Uh, I hope you're not sabotaging your work because, well, I'll get to that. But anyway, uh, he, I basically said, you know, I know you, you apparently can't talk about this because of your NDA, but when your NDA is not a, a part of it and you can talk about it, you're invited to come on my show. I'd love to have you on because we've had other creators and we can talk about this kind of stuff. And he said, consider it a date. Now, whether that's going to be something he follows through on or whether he's just blowing smoke, don't know. Uh, we'll, we'll see. Uh, now, somebody asked him after that about whether or not the plans for this book was part of 5G because that's been some of the rumors. And he basically responded and said that 5G was irrelevant to the story that he pitched, that he pitched a story for John. And Dan Didio liked the story, thought it was going to fit in with what his plans were. And so nothing beyond the pitch was written before Dan Didio left DC. So Jeff Thorne thought, well, you know, with Didio gone, this isn't going to go anywhere. A few weeks after Dan was fired from from DC, he got a call and they expressed interest in his story. So it's not exactly what he pitched, according to him. He said there are things going on across the line that influence all the things that are happening. So modifications had to be made, but this made, but this is the story he wanted to tell. And he goes on to say, you know, while no fan and while no Green Lantern has a, a target on his or her or its back, neither is any safe from permanent damage or death. That includes John. And at the end, he says, "I promise an extremely bumpy ride for all players," and then in caps, "all players." And you know, I, I guess, but you know, when you go back to Future State, if Future State is supposed to have any meaning, we know that, uh, let's see, who appears in Future State? John, Teen Lantern, Joe Mullane, Hal, Guy, and Jessica. So does that mean that Guy and Kyle are on the chopping block? Hmm. I didn't think about that. Right. That's an excellent point, right? Especially with what he said, you know what I mean? Because as I said earlier, if, if Future State is true, then any dramatic tension for those characters that I just listed are gone. You, you, and I will say that, I mean, if, if in fact Kyle Rayner ends up going or whatever, I mean, there's probably a bigger following of Kyle Rayner fans than there is Guy Gardner fans. I, that's just a guess. I mean, it's just how the temperament I feel. Right. Mm-hmm. It's going to piss off a lot of people. I think that Kyle Rayner is probably more popular than John Stewart is quite frankly. I would, I would argue that point too. Yeah. I would agree with that. Uh, but, but, you know, and I'm not saying they're on the chopping block, but, you know, please don't anybody put words in my mouth in that regards, but just in doing a little bit of detective work and looking at the future state books, Guy and Kyle and Simon, I forgot Simon, excuse me, those three characters are not mentioned in any way, shape or form. So if future state is the real future and there are characters that might be on the chopping block, those are the only three characters that could be on the chopping block. If, Man, I always thought Kyle would be a good fit in a Titans in a Titans book. I thought I mean, he, always, he always fit well before, you know. Yeah, I, I thought Kyle would have been to me the logical character for Far Sector, but you know, oh, um, that, that would have been good for him too. Yeah, that's right. a good point. Uh, but at any rate, uh, you know, if if as I said earlier, if, if Future State is going to have any real impact, then those three characters are really the only three that are in any jeopardy, and we've lost all dramatic tension about the rest of the characters because they know they're all going to survive. If Future State isn't really going to be the future of the DC Universe, then it's almost making itself invalidated. Why, why follow along or get invested in it? Other than I want to read a story, a what-if story, right? Uh, so we'll, we'll see. So, you know, like I said, I, I kind of follow some different things. I followed the Bleeding Cool story because Bleeding Cool covered it after, after, yeah. after I wrote my story. And I didn't do a big thing. I didn't make the title 
anything inflammatory. I just basically said Jeff Thorne takes over Green Lantern. And then I mentioned the controversy at the end of the article. I didn't want a sensationalistic thing to stir people up. You know, if people read it, they read it and, and they'll read themselves and, you know, whatever. Cosmic Book News took my story and made a headline out of it and quoted me and ran some of the images as well, which got a little more traction because he, he his his headline was much stronger than mine because I intentionally I wasn't trying to stir the pot, uh, but I think it's an important conversation to have this whole thing. And then Bleeding Cool took it and ran with it. And of course, you know the footprint that Bleeding Cool has. So it's become a big topic of conversation. When you when you look at when when I look at the different media, like I look at not media, but different different sites. If I look at Bleeding Cool and I look at Reddit and I look at a couple of other smaller places, there is a lot of backlash over this whole thing. Mm-hmm. There are a lot of people who uh, feel very put out that feel that wh- why in the world would DC give a Green Lantern book to someone who doesn't like 99% of, well, uh, not 99, but, you know, almost all, all the Green Lanterns but one. Uh, you know, why would you why would you do that? And then there are a few people that are a little bit, you know, okay, whatever. I, you know, I'm interested in reading a John story, whatever. Just don't write hell and we're okay. Uh, the Then you over at CBR, you've kind of got a group of people who are I don't want to say defending it, but they're trying to lessen the 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 um, impact of it primarily because they're strong John Stewart fans and they've been waiting for John Stewart to get a solo book for years. And there's a contingent over there that wants John Stewart to be the main Green Lantern and the heck with everybody else. Uh, so they're trying to they're they're kind of squashing any fans that are getting upset about this. They're kind of poo-pooing it a little bit. So it's an interesting dynamic to see, but. Uh, any, at any rate, uh, bef- before I share my opinions, Phil, I want to give you a chance to to share your thoughts because I've been talking for a while. Well, I mean, you know, we go back to what you said about like we all have our own likes. You know, it's like I trash talk Batman all the time. I trash talk Simon Baz all the time. But uh, I mean, I'll, I'll be the first to say, well, number one, I even have a Simon Baz Green Lantern figure. So hate the character or not, I still have him because he's part of a group of characters that I genuinely love. He's still a Green Lantern, you know. I may not like the character, but he's still part of it. And that being said, if I was given the opportunity to write a Batman or Simon Baz, I still would write them in the, in the most provocative way and the most interesting way that I could probably muster, even though I don't genuinely like the character, you know. It, like I've said, hey, hey, we need you to write a 10-story 10 10, 10 arc on Batman. You know, first I'd cringe because it's like, well, why of all people would you pick me to write Batman, you know? But then after I'd cringe, I'd be like, I don't have anything nice to say about Batman. And then after that, I'd be like, okay, well, I have to tell a story about Batman. And then I'd, and then I'd shuttle out a 10-story arc about Batman and be done with it. But... Again, this draws that line between the, the the professional and the unprofessional volume that you that you get yourself into when you become a comic book writer, you know. And you you had mentioned, I, I like I said, I've never heard of this guy before until his name was mentioned in the Future State book, and then of course you and I went back and forth a couple times in the text the other day when you when you had to forewarn me about <laughs> the direction you were going to go and what you were going to say, and you know. I love you all the same, Iron. You could you could have went off on a whole tangent and dropped all kinds of f bombs and this and that, and I just still stood by your side because you you shouldn't be allowed as a writer to come in and just automatically start. Well, I'm going to write about one character and then f everybody else. Well, that's not how the Green Lantern Corps works because it, it, the same story can be said about Guardians of the Galaxy. I'm going to write about Star Lord. Screw all the rest of the Guardians. Don't need to hear about them. Don't even need to write about them. Well, yeah, you do, because you have a fan base you need to cater to, you know. So if you're going to have a, 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 a let's say you're going to have a book that you're you're writing six issues for. Well, I get I get news for you. If you're going to write a six issue book and you're going to you're going to say screw the rest of the Lantern Corps, I just want to focus on John Stewart. You're going to lose probably about eighty to ninety percent of your fan base, and they're not going to read your book. And then you're gonna, and then and then they're gonna lose interest in Green Lantern altogether because then you've just dis- distanced that character and the Green Lantern Corps 
from the fan base that grew to like it, especially the ones that that you know really like the uh, the the Grant Morrison Liam Sharp run that's been going on for two years now. So then, put that. We've been reading this for you know two years now. If you put juxtapose that right next to a John Stewart book, and then you start alienating all your prime characters like Kyle Rayner and and, and and Guy Gardner and Jessica Cruz and all these other ones, you lose your fan base. Well, then you've lost then you've lost you know your credibility as a writer because then you're then you're basically saying, well, I'm just going to go ahead and agendize it and write who I want to write about and screw everybody else. Well, it doesn't work that way, man. I mean, you can't just you can't just take who you love and write about it and forget about everybody else like they don't exist. Uh, too many writers do that all the time. And, and But the way it works out is we see characters come and go. You know, Simon Baz has been off the field for a long time now. Where he's at, who, who knows? Will he come back? Maybe. But char- that's the ebb and flow of comic books, right? So, But on the other hand, I'll play devil's advocate. We're shifting from a... Hal Jordan centered book into over to a John Stewart centered book. Apparently that's the, that's the word anyway. Well, I'm okay with that. As long as you show worth to the other characters that make up the green lantern core, because even though Hal Jordan is your green lantern, my green lantern, probably a bulk of our fan base is green lantern. You know, there's still other green lanterns that exist and there's still other green lanterns that, make it a part of a collective whole. Then you lose your fan base for what it is to be a Green Lantern core or a core member for that matter. So then let's say the television series comes out, you know, well, then you're going to start throwing in all these other Green Lanterns, but you're only focusing on one in, in the books. It, that doesn't jive well with me because you can't split the two. You need to have them as a collective whole to keep your fan base intact. And, you know, as far as uh, his his comments on it and stuff like that, yeah, you trash talk all you want. You can't take back what you said. And I don't care what kind of shade you want to throw at your fan base now to think that they're going to forget about that stuff. They're not going to forget about it unless you show credibility in a Hal Jordan character going forward. Because the minute he writes a book and he shows Hal Jordan anything other than what you expect or I expect or our fan base expects the, the rest of us out there, you know, they're going to jump on him like hotcakes, you know, and it's, they're not going to be nice about it. We'll be nice about it because, you know, we're part of this podcast and I want to be professional with you because, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm your co-host, you know, and I want to show my worth as a fan to know that I'm saying the best thing and I'm saying it in the best way. And I'm not going to sound too derogatory or, you know, and, but the fan, fan base doesn't work that way, man. And, and we both know, we both know Twitter is a cesspool of people that will just, they'll rail you and they will rail you hard. We see it all the time with these writers, you know, look at, look at all these writers, Gerard Jones. I mean, does he even exist anymore on, on Twitter? I don't even know. I mean, but like they will ride him and he just better be careful moving forward. You know, you want to have a John Stewart title. That's cool. I'm all for it. I'll read it. You know, I'll check it out. If I don't like what I'm reading, I mean, I hate to say it. I'm, I'm going to troll you, <laughs> you know, Hey, you know, nice shade. You threw at Hal Jordan once again, you know, what happened to that whole, yeah, your, your, your comments, you know, and you wanted to take back and now you're contradicting yourself and now you're throwing shade at a character. No, nah, it doesn't work that way, dude. People don't go away that easy, and people don't forget as easy as you think they're going to forget. Just because you say something nice, you're going to have to show it rather than say it. Right. I mean, as recently as last year, he made a comment, and this is a quote, Hal Jordan is and has always been a worthless cardboard cutout. John Stewart should be the Green Lantern that last year. Uh, there's a tweet where uh, it's one of those, one, one of these has got to go type of things. And there's a picture of Jessica Cruz and three different characters who I don't recognize because most of them are Marvel. And his response was, bye-bye, Green Lantern, who's not Jon Stewart. <laughs> so, you know, again, everybody has their opinion and everybody's entitled to their opinion. But when you're a writer and you post that kind of stuff and then you're going to start to write a franchise, a book that's associated with that franchise, you should not be surprised when this stuff comes out of the woodwork. And his reaction has been, um, well, trust me, I'm not that way. Well, you haven't given us anything to 
prove that exactly. He's, he's shown that he's that way. He yeah. he basically rather than try to um, make a peace with the fan base and say, you know, those things are things that I expressed that maybe I didn't express them very well, and take take ownership of that of the lack of professionalism and the trollish behavior and the incendiary nature of his comments. Instead of doing that, he's basically trying to make it look like, well, you guys are just complaining and you haven't seen it yet. That's, that's a hard road to take because it's not a good approach to take no. because the, the fan base, I mean, they're, they're not a forgiving bunch. I mean, Jesus, man, you can't, even, they can't even let go of Batman versus Superman and justice league after this amount of time. You know, you, you he thinks that, he, he thinks that he can play coy with the fan base, man. They can see right through his act, you know, and they will. You know, it happens to writers. It happens to directors. It happens to, to actors, for that matter. I mean, look at Ryan Reynolds. I mean, mm-hmm. you know, he's I, trolling. He's been trolling yeah. Green Lantern for, for decades, years now. I mean, it's like, my God, you know, people see through that. And it's I, not funny yeah. anymore. I, I think the part that he fails to realize is because DC has done such a sloppy job of talking about what's going to be happening after Future State, that for all we know, and from the rumors we keep hearing, that DC is going to have a, a reduced line, for all we know, this Green Lantern book will be the only Green Lantern book, and we won't have a, a Justice League Odyssey for someone to be in, and we won't have other places for these characters to show up. So they're looking at this as, well, like when they launched Hal Jordan and the Green Lantern Corps and Green Lanterns, this is it. We might only be getting one book, though. And this is how you're talking about all the characters that make up the book. And talking about Green, Hal, and, and I, I don't want this to become a fanboyish comment, but let's remember that Green Lantern is built on Hal Jordan's shoulders. So this isn't like talking about a secondary character. You're talking about the character that has led the franchise for most of its publication history and is most identified by its appearances in media outside of comics. So this Mm -hmm. isn't like, you know, this is akin to what if Marvel reduced all of the X-Men books down to one book and none of the characters that were in the X-Men got a solo title and you hired a writer who's gone on record of saying they hate Wolverine. (laughs) They'd have his head on a pike. Or... (laughs) If you if you if you condensed all the Batman books down to one Batman book and you've hired a writer who hates Bruce Wayne, same difference. Yeah, it really is. And but you, but if you go to explain that to him, I, I, he'd argue against that. Oh sure, yeah. because he's he's not taking any ownership for it. I think that's the thing that really he he, he rather than rather than realize oh you know the things I have said are causing a problem. I need to do something to make up for it. His his. Reaction is more of you're just going to have to wait and see, and that's on you. Well, of course, you're going to wait and see because he, because number one, he's probably thinking he he doesn't want to give it away, and number two, he's already done what he wants to do, so he he doesn't want to give give any kind of credibility towards. Well, I better not reveal what I did because I'm going to lose writers now. I'd rather lose them later, or I, I, readers now. I'd rather lose them later when they read the book. Right. I, I How mean, fair is that? He, um, he honestly can't talk about the details of the of the book because he does have an NDA and, and, and writers are not allowed to talk about this stuff. I mean, I've, we've done interviews in the past with, with different creators and – I always ask them ahead of time, what can't you talk about? Because I don't want to ask you about it. And it, it's it's funny how oftentimes when we do those interviews after we're done recording, then they talk all about that kind of stuff. Uh, <laughs> funny how that works. Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, we've, I've had some very interesting conversations with Robert Venditti and Ethan Van Skyver and, and Dan Jurgens, and, and, and these are off-the-record conversations that I've had. And, you know, things, things happen that they can't talk about. And... Oftentimes, people are judged for it. Um, unfortunately, sometimes harshly, uh, you know. <laughs> but when it comes to this, you know, I realize he can't talk about the details of the book. But you need to take ownership for what you said and the weight those words had, and you need to apologize for them. And that's not what he's doing. He's basically, this is my opinion, and if you don't like it, eh. And well, don't that, be so snobbish about it. You right, know? right. You know, just say, hey, look, you know, I made these comments. Yeah, I'm not a huge Hal Jordan fan. I was a little harsher than I should have been. Uh, but truth be told, you know, I, I want to do a Lantern book that's focused on Jon Stewart. But of course, I want to include all the other Lanterns in there as well. And then he could even say it would be much the same as when Venditti did Hal Jordan and the Green Lantern Corps. 
you know, I'm doing a John Stewart centered book, mm-hmm. but I am going to have the other characters in there, and, and each one will have their due. Right, and, and he may not be he may not even be allowed to talk that much, but at the same time, he could at least have. I, I was thinking about the word as you were talking. He he's shown no humility in this. Right. And that's what I don't think he gets. Sure, you're entitled to your opinion, but if you say something that really offends people to the level of which we're seeing, you're sabotaging your own book before it even hits the shelves. And you need to step back and take ownership of it and say, you know, I'm sorry if I offended people. Maybe I was stronger than I should have been. And I hope you'll join me for the ride because I've got a good story coming. Speak from the heart, not this posturing. And, and that's the unfortunate thing is that all I see coming out of him is posturing. Well, because most writers like if, if but if a writer has that kind of mentality, that means they have an agenda beforehand going in and they don't want that to stray their course. And that's all well and good. Most writers do have their own agenda. I just don't like it when their agenda is being force fed down uh, uh, in my face, you know, because at the end of the day, you know, I'm the one buying this stuff from this company. And if I need to be force fed agenda, just because for agenda's sake, I, I don't need. I'm 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 smarter than that. I don't I don't need to be sold on that, and I won't buy it. You know, I I won't buy it because what'll happen is, and I, I know myself is, if I don't like it and I feel like it's being done, I'm going to troll you. You know, hey, your writing's crap. You know, you, you you did this, you did this, you did this. You know, what kind of writer are you? Now. I'm not going to prejudge the guy because he, I, I don't read Marvel, so I, I guess he, he, he did stuff over at Marvel. And I'm going to ask my friend Brian if he's familiar with him or if he read anything by him uh, when I see him tomorrow night uh, and, and and maybe get his thoughts on it if he's read any of his material or stuff. But, uh, you know, but I'm, I'm going to give him his credit. You know, I'm, I'm, going to, I'm going to see what the title's like because, you know, we're on the blog of Boa, we're on the podcast of Boa, and... Fair is fair, and uh, I'll give it a fair shake. But at the end of the day, if I don't if I don't like what he's doing with the franchise, uh, I'm not going to hold back on it. <laughs> Neither will you. <laughs> no, no. Uh, he he uh, to give an idea. He he is an actor as well as a writer and producer. So he has done things like let's see, he's an actor. He's he hasn't really acted in the last twenty years, but he did things before. He uh, he was on the reboot of In the Heat of the Night, and he played Sergeant Wilson. <laughs> uh, that that that's kind of the most thing, recent thing he's done as an actor. He kind of retired from the acting gig, uh, but he's been the producer on Magnum PI. Uh, he produced he was co executive producer on three episodes of that show. Uh, he was the super, supervising producer for Avengers Assemble. Uh, he's done co-producer and producer for The Librarians, uh, that TV series when it was on the air. Uh, he's written for Avengers Assemble. He's written for Justice League Action. Uh, he's written for Ultimate Spider-Man. He's written on The Librarians. He's written Ben 10. Uh, he wrote an episode of Law and Order Criminal Intent. So he's got, uh, you know, he's, and I guess he's written some novels as well. He wrote a Star Trek novel. I know that much too. Uh, you know, he's got a, a, a broad range of things that he's done work in so you know by no means do i think this is someone who doesn't know how to write because obviously he's making a living at it and he's been able to leave the acting part to do producing and writing Uh, i just think that his his personal incendiary comments really have left a bad taste in people's mouths and yeah i'm gonna i'll kind of give the book a shot but i'm gonna be looking at it through a very different lens than if i hadn't seen all the stuff that he saw he did on twitter yeah, it's called skeptical. Yeah, you know? I'm very skeptical at this point. And I, I I, don't care whether there's a book starring Jon Stewart. That doesn't bother me. Uh, but I'm worried that if DC is shrinking the line down and this is going to be the only way we see any Green Lantern, we've put it in the hands of somebody who only likes one of them. And well, regardless of what he says he's going to do professionally, he's already said he can't put his bias aside on Hal Jordan. Well, so that begs the question... Uh, I, I doubt they'll get rid of one of their their main titles like Justice League. What does that mean? John Stewart's going to be in Justice League and the Green Lantern book? Oh, we don't know because we don't we don't know what any of those books look like. Huh. I'd be curious to see, I know the answer to that, right? Because that's going to be a double dose of John Stewart all the time, right? Well, yeah. it, it, but maybe maybe it's a trade off. Maybe if John Stewart is going to going to headline the Green Lantern book, does Hal go back to Justice League? Or, you know, who knows what's going to happen. Maybe we'll be surprised and maybe there will be another Green Lantern book besides that one. We, you know, unfortunately, DC, 
you and I have spoken about it before. They're not their communication really does not. They're not doing a good job of getting fans excited for their line. All they've done is left a lot of questions, and people are filling in the blanks based on what information they have, just like they're doing in this situation. Mm-hmm. And not knowing that there's going to be anything else, you're left up in the air. They, I think they made the mistake of announcing two or three titles in Brazil, and that was it. If you remember back when they did the whole DC Rebirth event, they did a whole show that was being streamed live on the internet, and they released all of the titles and all the information about what was going to be there, who the creative teams were, who's starring in the books. They gave you pictures, of, you know, like the covers of some of the the books. You know, the, there was enough there to build some hype, and at least you knew, okay, my favorite character is X, and I know I can look at the, for this book with my favorite character in it, regardless of who it was. And that's what's missing here. You know, as much as people complain about Dan Didio, one of the things I think he was really good at was being the P.T. Barnum for DC Comics. No, yeah, that's a good point. And he was. I mean, he, I liked him. I didn't. I didn't have a problem with him at all. I always thought. I always thought he was really, really uh, uh, forthcoming about his information. He liked to talk about projects. He liked to talk about ideas and stuff that they were coming up with. Now he wouldn't give away the. I mean, he wouldn't give away the, everything, like the behind-the-scenes stuff. He wouldn't. He wouldn't give away all the information about it, but he would be forthcoming about what they were interested, what they were going, what their plans were, what they were doing. Maybe we're, we're we're working on this. We might be working on this. And but again, this goes back to what you and I have said countless, countless times. If there's some kind of secretive nature that DC likes to revolve around, I mean, Warner Brothers for that matter. I mean, or AT and T, whatever you want to call it. It seems like this big umbrella encapsulates this whole entire communicative shell and they're not allowed to tell anybody anything for fear of what i don't know i mean the only thing i can think of is they're 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 fearful they're going to lose people because they make crappy decisions i mean it's the only thing i can think of you know and and probably the only bit of information that i thought that warner brothers uh or at&t whatever you want to call them has has done for me personally is by allowing Zack snyder to finally finish his vision of an actual justice league movie and that's the only thing that i think has come out recently that i feel like has been a fulfilling advancement in their agenda other than that i just feel like they're just that sometimes they flounder you know the the, the future state thing i'm not you know i'm not i'm not excited about it i mean it just it doesn't make me feel good as a comic book fan because it's like oh what is this i don't i don't like it I don't think it, I don't think it works for the base. Well, but, nothing was given to us to get us excited about it. Yeah, I mean, just send out some preview issues. You know, how about how about some? You know, every every once in a while they do. They used to do previews all the time. You know, check out the first few pages of such and such. Check out the first. They don't they don't do any of that anymore, and it's like, why? I mean, don't you want to get people excited, or are you fearful that it's such a crap decision that you don't want to put out? You don't. You don't want to give up the ghost because the ghost is going to come back and haunt you. I, I, I sometimes just don't get it. And whoever they're, whoever's in charge of their PR, I mean, I'm sorry. They need to be canned, done. I mean, because it just doesn't do them any good. And that's the way, that's the way it is. You don't have anybody really <laughs> speaking for the brand. I mean, earlier, earlier today, now you and I uh, are recording this on December 10th. Earlier on today, Disney did a big presentation thing oh, yeah. for their investors. And you had Ooh. the person who's the spokesman for Star Wars coming out and announcing all of the new Star Wars projects that are being released with Ooh. teaser trailers. It was an amazing teaser trailer for uh, Rogue Squadron with Patty Jenkins, which Huge. got me very Huge. excited for it. And I did not know her father was a fighter pilot. And I now want to see Patty Jenkins direct a Hal Jordan movie because <laughs> she gets the fighter pilot thing. Uh, I mean, that's information flow right yeah, there. I mean, right. So, and, and it's funny because you mentioned that because my brother was uh, texting me earlier about it. And I told him, I was like, all that is is Disney's response to, to what uh, HBO Max and Warner decided they wanted to do. Right. Except that Disney upped the ante. They sure. Said, okay. Warner Brothers is going to do this with all their movies next year. Guess what? Here's what we're doing, and look how much it, it blew them out of the water. Right. All the stuff that they're making, the why the last man was announced, uh, a, a, a crap ton of other stuff for Hulu, and it blew Warner Brothers media out of the water. Done. Yeah. They're going to say Warner what? HBO Max what? <laughs> right. And, and the thing is, is this wasn't like it was a response to Warner Brothers. This is stuff they were working on because yeah. they're aggressively doing this stuff. And then they had, you know, Kevin Feige came out and talked about the next slate of Marvel projects. 
And there's a you know basically wave four of the Marvel movies. They announced everything in the 2022, but here Warner Brothers is we don't know anything more beyond what we saw at DC Fandom. Um, <laughs> and I forgot about it. I don't even know why you mentioned it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, there was just what little bit was there, and, and where's everything else? You know, supposedly Jeff Johns was supposed to have his script for the Green Lantern Corps movie turned in at the beginning of the year. So is this I'll project what, dead? What are we doing? You know, I'll tell you what happened. They put all their money into Justice League instead of everything else. I mean, yeah, come on, I, man. I mean, that's the only thing they have is Justice League. Well, I mean, don't get me wrong. I mean, I'm completely stoked for Wonder Woman 84. And go them for releasing it on Christmas and giving it to the fans the way they are. But after that, what's what What do we got? Right, Justice where, League? Where's the person for DC Entertainment coming out there and getting people excited and presenting and laying out, here's the future of the movies. Here's what we're doing. Here's the projects that we have in the works. Here's some teaser stuff. It's just not that well thought out. And the same comes true with the DC products since, da- since Dan Didio left. I think Dan did a good job of that kind of stuff. You know, He would go to the conventions and engage with fans and do the panels. And because of COVID, we don't have the panels, but we have nobody engaging in other media doing anything that's promoting anything. Where's, where's Jim Lee, who's the, the publisher? Why isn't he out there really getting people excited for the projects that are coming out. Yeah, you he's can't, been kind of quiet, hasn't he? Yeah, you can't just release a trailer and think that's going to let people get excited. There's there's nothing there to get people excited. So anyway, we're, we're starting to beat a dead horse, so I, I don't want to go much longer on it. But uh, my whole thing on this whole Twittergate thing is I think it's bad form. Uh, I think it's very unprofessional commentary, regardless of whether he was doing it as a fan or not. It still carries weight because it's still got his name attached to it. And sadly, he's not taking ownership and is not showing the humility to try to uh, put fans at ease. Instead, he's kind of like, well, I'm a professional writer, and I'll set that aside. Well, that doesn't that doesn't mean a whole lot. Right. Anyway. Well, again, it all goes back to that whole thing we've said countless times, and countless times we'll say it again. Only time will tell. Right. <sighs> and, uh, you know, I, I'm always cautiously optimistic about stuff. I'm just less optimistic and more cautious this time around. Yeah. I would agree with that. I am too. I mean, I, I generally wasn't looking forward to Future State. I'm not looking forward to the other end of Future State because, you know, you just, you just, you don't know what's the other end, you know? And, like, I, I don't like that feeling because I like to prepare myself. It's like, okay, well, I'm interested in this. I'm, 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 hell, you, you, sometimes you lose subscribers, you know, because it's like, if people don't know, like, if, if, if like, if, we're not going to make an Aquaman book. Okay, well, at least I know, so I know what not to spend my money on. But how about something else that I know that I want to spend my money on in lieu of that being gone, you know? But right. If you don't have an idea, I mean, it's not like I'm budgeting for it, but if I don't have an idea, then it's going to be like, okay, well, I'm going to lose interest in that amount of time. And then I drop a book. I'm already going to get rid of Justice League. Now, I will pick up Justice League again if they decide to, to put Hal Jordan in it, you know, but... Outside of that, I'm I'm gonna read my last couple issues of Justice League, and I'm after this year, I'm I'm done with it. I'm just getting bored with it. Right. I, I think he just, uh, you know, I I'm paying attention to different conversations on multiple fronts, and other than comic book resources message boards, it's very negative, and, and I don't want to say hostile, but people are like, that's it, I'm done. I, I've had it. I'm not dealing with it. I, I'm not gonna buy anything with this guy's name on it. And he needs to pull his head out of the clouds or wherever else it might be and um, really think about how you're going to address the fans in a way that's going to win them back because people are not happy. And I'm afraid that that's going to sabotage his entire project. And then it's going to be blamed on hell fans because, well, they didn't support the book and yada, yada, yada. You know you know how it's going to be. Mm-hmm. And, and I'll just add one last thing. If... If any writer or creator had made comments about the, like this about John Stewart, we'd be having a different conversation because that person probably would have lost the book. Oh, definitely. Oh, you're not kidding. So right. anyway, we've got some positive stuff to talk about. We've got a great comic book to talk about. So why don't you and I? Uh, I need to get another drink, and uh, <laughs> and we'll come back and we'll talk about Green Lantern number six. Awesome. In brightest day, in blackest night, no evil shall escape my sight. Let those who worship evil's might beware my power, Green Lantern's light. There are many tales in the Book of Oa, but have you ever heard one that's not about a Green Lantern? 
in loudest din. Captain, to all hands, load the escape pods. This is a full evacuation. But sir, the gravity, the pods won't make it. Or hush profound. So, then we're doomed. My ears catch evil's slightest sound. Attention, Green Lanterns. You are harboring Grylar. Let those who told out evil's knell. This is a crime punishable by extermination. Beware my power, the F-sharp bell! Green Lantern, Ring of Victory, a fan-made audio drama, premiering on YouTube. All right, my friend, we have a comic book to talk about, and we're going to be talking about Green Lantern number six from early in the Jeff Johns run. And this is kind of the conclusion of the first arc, the full, full arc. Uh, if you look at the edition of, of No Fear, this is the last issue in the book. And before we start talking about the contents of the book, the cover, wow. You know, um, it, it, the art on the inside is Simon Bianchi, or Simon Bianchi. I'm not sure which way it is. I'm sure I've slaughtered it either way. Uh, but the cover by Ethan Van Skyver with black hand and the absolutely maniacal, his head is back and the hand is up. Uh, with Hal across the cover. What a dynamic cover. Yeah, and his red eyes. Yeah, oh, such a great image. Uh, but, you know, we, we've talked about before, when we're reading some of these issues, we're reading it through different eyes. Because at the time these issues came out, we had no idea what Jeff Johns had planned. Not at all. And now that we know how Jeff Johns' run plays out, there are a couple of things in this issue which are so strongly hinted at that I, I facepalmed when I read it the, over the weekend when I was prepping for this episode. I facepalmed myself a couple of times going, oh my gosh, it's right there. It's right there. And he's, he had to have been laughing maniacally himself as he was writing this stuff in the script thinking, they don't know what this is about. It looks like a throwaway line, but oh boy, I know what's coming. <laughs> All right, you'll have to pinpoint exactly which oh, part yeah. of Yeah. But uh, the, the art style in this issue, um, and again, I don't know if it's Simon Bianchi or Bianchi, so I apologize if I pronounced it wrong. But the artwork uh, is very different than what we've seen thus far in this run with Carlos Pacheco and Ethan Skyver's work. Uh, it, this is very uh, almost a very watercolory looking book. Mm-hmm. And as a single issue, it doesn't stand out so much as a sharp contrast because you're reading it you know, once a month. In a collected form, it really kind of, it's almost... Um, I don't want to say shocking, but it, it almost takes me out of it a little bit because the art style is so different. Yeah, not, that it's, not that it's ugly or bad. It just it's, it's such a contrast to what we've been seeing so far. But uh, it, it's jarring. And, and art is uh, and arts like that, you know, I mean, I mean, nothing against any artist out there, but there's not one artist that can write a medium or that can draw a medium that's going to cater to every single person, period. Right. It, it doesn't exist and it won't ever exist. When you look at Carlos Pacheco and Ethan Van Skyver's work, it's similar enough that it isn't so jarring. But because you're going to this this more of a, a painted watercolory style uh, coloring and the artwork is a different style, it's such a contrast. It does take you out of it a little bit. But that, that stuff aside, you know, when we looked at the last issue, you know, Hal was fighting the shark underwater and the giant spaceship comes up and this issue starts rewinding just a little bit. And we see it from the perspective of the sailors that are in the bay at Coast City and they're there when the ship comes out of the water. So it's a little bit of a rewind and we see the gremlins, as they're calling them, but the Krolatians, uh again, still speaking in German. And they're looking at Hal, who has kind of collapsed on the surface of the ship after he's been attacked. And they basically say he's stronger, but he's still human. Uh, his genetics are as malleable as the rest, and his arm must be deleted. So they want to, they want to cut his arm off. And again, this is in German, so I've, I've used Google Translate to figure out what it was that they actually said. But they're on the ship, and, and Hector Hammond is trying to get his attention. And Hector just looks so bizarre because... He's, his head is so big and his body is so small and they've removed the top of his skull. So you see his brain just kind of sitting there <laughs> yeah. and uh, they've, been, they've been working on him. So they're, they're doing something to Hector Hammond and Hal's trying to deal with the Krolatians. And in a nutshell, uh, they basically, you know, they're, they're trying to fight it and fight it out and Black Hand shows back up. You know, we saw when we ended that last issue, Black Hand walked through the hospital and killed all those people. He's back at full juice of power and he's there 
uh, to take on Hal as well. And he'll say, he says, you know, you'll be the 23rd person I've killed today, but that doesn't make me a bad man. And then he says, and here's some of the, <laughs> here's, here's some of the throwaway. He says, death is good and death wants you back. <laughs> and uh, he's, he's fighting Hal and uh, Hal says, you know, been there, done that, got the t-shirt. But then it, it gets, it, you know, talks about, you know, the fact that Hal took his hand in Green Lantern Rebirth and so on. And he goes, you know, you think you're strong, but death is stronger. Is the pure power at the far end of the emotional spectrum, the emptiness of space. Now, we haven't seen the emotional spectrum yet. So yeah. it seems like a throwaway line. And then he says the blackest night right afterwards. So mm-hmm. right there is the two big things about the emotional spectrum and the blackest night. All that foreshadowing. And people, it, it, at the time, you just read it and it's, it seems like nothing. Right. Wow, it's funny you mentioned that. I just picked it up myself. Uh, I, wow. I think it's just just really cool. Uh, and Hal is struggling dealing with, you know, he's being attacked on two fronts. He's got Black Hand after him. He's got uh, the Cruel of Tones after him. And then we're getting some more flashbacks. And we see how uh, Jeff Johns has kind of fleshed out Hal's background a little bit in terms of uh, his parents and what happened with him and being in the Air Force. And it, and you see a scene where Hal's really little and his mother's making him promise him that he'll never be a pilot. And they force Hal to promise it. So we see the scene where, where Hal's making this promise that he knows he can't fight's going on. And then uh, Edwards Air Force Base has sent pilots there. So Cowgirl is uh, out there and trying to uh, get involved in the fray as well. So they're shooting at the, the, the ship. And um, <clears throat> there's a whole thing where they jump on board Cowgirl's pilot or her plane. And they basically want to take the machine and they want to <clears throat> take the girl apart. Which is kind of scary. And Hal's also attacked by the shark. So he's really getting hit from all sides in this, this issue. Uh, so we see more cutbacks and we see the scene where uh, Hal has joined the Air Force. <clears throat> it's been like four or five years and we learn that Hal's mother was dying. <clears throat> but she won't let Hal in to see him. Because he broke his promise. And that she made it clear that he wasn't welcome. And they're not going to, you know, his brothers, Jack and Jim, are not going to let Hal upset her. Uh, you can't be surprised she's acting this way. You broke your promise. And Hal says, I was a 10-year-old kid. And, you know, his brothers kind of admonished him. Not not so much Jim. You know, Jim is kind of more in the middle. You know, Jim's the, the peacemaker of the, of the three. And Hal says, how do I fix it? And then it cuts back and forth. And basically they say, you can't fix everything, Hal. And then the battle lands Hal in the cemetery in Co City, right near his parents' gravestones, as he sees uh, a flashback of Hal being admonished for stealing the jet and punching the general and getting kicked out of the Air Force. He did it so that he could get kicked out and say to his mother that I'm not flying anymore because his mother is on her deathbed. Right. And then we find out that when Hal gets there, she's already passed. So it adds um, some layers of depth to that whole origin of Hal and how he, um, what led, you know, before he gets the ring, some of his background in his childhood and some of the trauma that he carries with him. And it's interesting that, you know, Black Hand does the whole death is all around you kind of thing. And we see the scene where Hal is there uh, identifying Jack's body because his brother Jack ultimately dies. And, uh, you know, Hal says, I'm not afraid of death. And Hal, and Black Ant says, no, but you, ha- you hate it, don't you? You hate death. And he says, no, I just hate you. And he cuts off Black Ant's hand again, which I thought was kind of funny. Right. <laughs> Poor guy. And then he buries Black Hand in the dirt. Now, this is when Black Hand appears later on in Blackest Night, then. Um, well, things happen in the middle of this, but he gets thrown in the ground and kind of buried over... And uh, Black Hand's last words in this issue are, death has its power. It's the true color of the universe, which again, if we know our Blackest Night history, black was first. It was all blackness. And he says, it's the most wonderful color. It's my color. Again, foreshadowing to where we know Black Hand goes. <clears throat> and the uh, the pilots have done a good job on the UFO, the, the spaceship. It's coming down with Han- Hector Hammond in it and Hal uh, gets warned by Hector. So Hal makes a giant fighter pilot who grabs the, the ship and keeps it from crashing. And, of course, you get, oh, how Jordan, my hero. <laughs> <laughs> you got to love Hammond, man. <laughs> He's so creepy. 
Uh, he is. <laughs> and, and again, that's the whole re-envisioning of, of these villains. You know, Jeff Johns takes Hector Hammond and Black Hand, who are kind of somewhat throwaway villains, and really elevates them to A-list status. Now, is that the three villains on the back of that flatbed right there, right? Uh, the flatbed truck that's in the end of the issue has got the Manhunter head because he fought the Manhunters earlier in this arc, and Hector Hammond, and then you see the Black Hand logo. So they're, they're being carted away. Uh, and then we get kind of a, a denouement or a connection scene between General Stone and Hal because Hal's in General Stone's office looking at a picture of his parents uh, together with Stone before Martin Jordan passes away. And so there's that, that friendship that's there. And uh, Hal basically takes the spaceship, takes it from space to give it to the Green Lanterns of the other sector, and they too are speaking German. And that's kind of the the punchline to it in that uh, German is not native to us. That's actually the Krolotolan language and that Germany kind of adopted it. And uh, they said, what, you think Egypt is the only place on that mud ball that stole their language from off world? <laughs> kind of funny. And then it's funny on that one part, it says you are in violation of, of sector 4141 of the Book of Oa. Yeah, Nature, yeah. National Evolutionary Chain. Uh, sub-level organism. Because what the, you know, the Krolotolans were big on coming to Earth, which we were, you know, we're not involved in a species, so they could you you do their DNA genetic modifications and uh, evolve us into something that could be turned into a biological weapon. And then you get the really kind of the scary thing at the end. You get this scene with Hector Hammond and he's talking to the head of the Manhunter and he's talking about how, you know, Green Lantern saved me. Yes, he did. You should have seen it. And I was rescued by the greatest Green Lantern there ever was. And the machine, of course, just says, no man escapes the Manhunters. And he's like, you know, I hate machines. But then he says, I'll tell you a secret. I knew they were coming for me and I knew Green Lantern would stop them. And as for me, I'm free. You see, they opened me up and pulled out my cortex and they did more experiments. And well, and then it ends with a panel that's just a close up of his mouth. And he says, things are a little different Creepy Hector Hammond. Yeah. That's a real creepy vision of Hector Hammond right there, too, that side shot of him. Yeah. Yeah. I, it's one place where I think the artwork really stands out, but um, a neat way to end the arc. That was a good run. I liked all six, all six of the. Well, I like, I'm a big Black Hand fan. He's all, I mean, it's like I got my top villains, and Black Hand has always been at the top five. I like Cyborg Superman and Max Lord. That probably rounds out my top villains. Um, but Black Hand has always been. When he when he came in Blackest Night, I was I was stoked. I was like, man, that's so good to see him again. Because he just, it, in some of his earlier stuff where he's written, he just seems kind of clunky, kind of like not really a formidable kind of maniacal villain. But when Blackest Night comes, he he comes full force, you know. And he got his he got his spotlight in that a lot. I mean, even though it didn't end up well for him. He's still got a good spotlight in that, and uh, that was probably that was probably my favorite part of the whole Blackest Night storyline was uh, seeing Black Hand, and some of the covers that came out with him in it. I mean, they were just gorgeous covers. I just loved every single one of them. Yeah, yeah. It, it, the the neat thing thing about this this early part of the run is that everything is written so tightly because Jeff Johns had all the time in the world to plan this stuff out. So the scripts are a lot different than what you would see later on where, you know, he he didn't have the luxury of all the planning time that he has here. And mm -hmm. uh, everything is, is just so well thought out. Nothing is, is excess. You know, those lines of dialogue that I, you know, you read it now and you're like, oh, my word. You know, if I don't, you know, you don't know what you don't know what's coming. So you don't see it as anything. But you go back and look at it now and it's like, wow, you know, it's all there. It all makes sense. And that's what I loved about this run was that everything up to a point, I want to say after Blackest Night, things kind of got went downhill a little bit. I don't think Jeff knew where to go. But up through that Blackest Night story, everything just had meaning. You know, there might be some, you know, some throwaway stuff or some just fun stuff or, you know, things that are, are frivolous. But for the most part, everything has a purpose. And it just, there's little subtle things that they get planted in there. So that when things happen later on, it all of a sudden makes sense. And that's something that's so easy to overlook, that whole comment, that whole three line of the blackest night and and the whole emotional spectrum. Who would have thought to think of anything of it? Right. Nobody. 
I mean, it'd be curious. To, I mean, you can't go back in time and, and relive those moments to see if there's anybody out there that, well, I guess you could see if there's anybody wrote anything out there about it. But I, I mean, it's easy. Hindsight's twenty twenty. But putting yourself into that context and that frame of mind, I wouldn't have been able to foresee what they were doing with Blackest Night. And to be quite honest with you, Blackest Night was one of the big events that got me back into reading comics. So I didn't read a lot of these issues that Jeff Johns did until after I read Blackest Night. As a matter of fact, I read Sinestro Corps War after I read Blackest Night. Wow. Yeah. Because hmm. I went back. I was like, all right, well, I like Blackest Night. I need to go back and see some of the stuff that led up to it. And it actually, it was actually kind of cool because I was like, all right, so Blackest Night Happened took place. I read all the issues. And then I went back and did the pre-stuff. And I was like, oh, that's kind of cool how it all led up to the Blackest Night. But stuff like that I wouldn't have picked up on because, you know, back then I didn't I didn't dissect comics like I do now. Back then it was more just like I read them and then the next one came along and the next one came along. Now I'm in a different frame, especially after I went through school and grad school and stuff. You know, I just, I now I analyze all the titles, you know, I pick them apart, pull them apart like we do on the show and stuff like that, which has helped. So, um, yeah, it was, a, it, was a, it was a different kind of reading momentum I had going back then. But, but now I'm like that kind of person that I have to read stuff prior before I can read the later stuff. You know what I mean? Like. I don't want to know what happens. I need this, this stuff to know what happens leading up to the big events and stuff. Yeah. It's chronological. It's, yeah. It makes it easier for me now. It's interesting to have, have experienced it as it unfolded because you have no idea what's coming. Right. Uh, but now to be able to read it in hindsight and knowing what, what the roadmap is, it just makes it a lot of fun. Hey, um, my power ring just started blinking. I don't know about yours. Oh, yeah. Mine's going off like crazy. So why don't we pause real quick? I, I think our power ring's got something to tell us. All right. All right, we'll be right back. In brightest day, in blackest night, no evil shall escape my sight. Let those who worship evil's might beware my power. Green Lantern's light! Green Lantern Myron and Green Lantern Phil, you have incoming transmissions. Would you like me to play them? Well, Phil, we were right. We've got messages. So, Power Ring, go ahead and play for us the first message. The first message is from Corey. Corey is talking about aquatic green lanterns. Playing in three, two, one. Great show, as always. Phil, I am sorry to hear about your mother. I understand how difficult it is because my mom passed away this summer. In the last episode, you guys talked about an underwater green lantern. There is an aquatic Green Lantern from Space Sector 1582, named Lynn Canar. He was featured in Green Lantern Corps Quarterly No. 3, and he had a cameo in the Green Lantern movie. He might be a nice candidate for the Know Your Core segment. Keep up the good work, guys. The new listener feedback format is very enjoyable. Hey, Corey. Uh, yeah, thanks for your thanks for your kind sentiment. Um, uh, I appreciate it. Uh, it's, it's, been, it's been difficult, and uh, as, as I'm sure you know, since your mom passed away this summer, too, um, our, our family's getting through it and, uh, we're, we're walking the steps that we need to walk and, uh, we're checking in on dad <laughs> frequently. As a matter of fact, I went by his house today, but he wasn't, <laughs> he wasn't home and I didn't call him ahead of time. So, uh, but, uh, in answer to your other question, uh, yeah. So an aquatic green lantern from sector one, five, eight, two. And you know what? Thank you for bringing that to my attention. Cause I did not know the character's name and I, I like what you included on here. So, uh, I think I'm going to take you up on that, and, uh, and I'm going to include that one in my Know Your Core segment. You know, I was thinking about it, too. There was another one, too, uh, not Kaloy. He's the guy who's the fish head with the bowl over his head. Oh, yeah. Okay, I, I didn't I, talk about yeah, that one. I'd forgotten all about him. Uh, so, yeah, it made me think about it. Yeah, Corey, Corey Goodcatch, uh, you know, he knows his core. <laughs> he knows his core, right, right, right. Thanks, Corey. I appreciate your, uh, appreciate your comments, man. All right, it looks like we've got another message coming in. Go ahead, Power Ring. Let us have the next one. The next message is from Zach. Zach's message is about the HBO Max series. Playing in three, two, one. Adore the show. Loving you all going back through the Jeff Johns run. Been a lot of fun. I just wanted to share my thoughts on the HBO Max show changing some things around. For instance, Alan Scott being gay these days has proved itself rather controversial. 
but I would argue his sexuality has never been essential to the character. Alan doesn't have that great romance like Hal Jordan or Kyle Rayner do, so it's no harm to a fan like me. If it helps someone see themselves on screen, that's great. Now guy being married? That's hard to swallow. Myron and Phil, I know you guys were also bummed about introducing a brand new character to the show when so many GLs have yet to be represented. But let's remember Razor and Aya were invented for the animated series, and they're now fan favorites. I'm approaching the show with cautious optimism. Hey Zach, thanks so much for writing in. Uh, I appreciate the fact that you like us going back and doing the Johns run. This has been a lot of fun. It's interesting to go back. I don't think I've reread the entire run since it ended. So this has really been a fun journey because you're looking at it with different eyes and you, you pick up on things you didn't pick up the first time. So you really, I'm really starting to appreciate it uh, even more so. And you know, the, the HBO Max show, I don't know. Um, I don't like the fact that they're changing the characters around. You know, I, it, we've always said, you know, we want the characters when we see them to be true to the, co- true to the, the comics that inspired them. Because, you know, as we know, every character is somebody's favorite character. And if it's your favorite character, you want to see them the way that you know them and the way that you love them. So, eh, I don't know. But I agree with you. Seeing Guy Gardner married is a little hard to swallow. Uh, and about the new character, I like your point about Razor and Aya. Uh, you know, I agree. Razor and Aya were characters that were created for the animated series that, you know, they had to create characters that they could do things with that weren't the part of the IP. You know, they they weren't part of the the Green Lantern canon. You know, they couldn't have killed Guy Gardner in the animated series because it's, you know, Warner Brothers character. But with Razor and Aya, they could go places with that character that they couldn't go with the regular Green Lanterns. And maybe that's what they're doing here. You know, maybe this new partner for Guy Gardner is going to give them that opportunity that they think they need. Uh, so we'll wait and see. I, I appreciate you bringing that up because it's a good point. It's a very fair point. What about you, yeah, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't have thought about them too either. And you know what? It's, it's sad because... Uh, the, the only two; those are the only two characters that are ever ever talked about, and it's only with association to the animated series, and and that's where their spotlight was. And you know, they were both cool characters. I'll honestly say that I did I wasn't attracted to either, either or. Uh, I thought Aya was kind of cool. Razor, I wasn't a really really big fan of. Um, but as far as uh, as the Alan Scott topic, um, no, I I, I, re, I, I reflect a lot of your uh, a lot of your points, um, and there's really not an argument for his his sexuality per se, except that I would add that the argument is on the the, the producer side. You know, they're the ones that push this agenda to highlight a specific point about a character that they feel needs to cater to a a minority group or a majority group for that matter. And it doesn't matter what it is because to me, it feels like that's an agenda that they think is going to attract new readers just because it adheres to their specific social status. And uh, I just, I don't like when writers do that for the writer's sake or when producers do that for the producer's sake, just because of that aspect alone. Uh, more often than not, I usually feel like the sexuality of a character or uh, or whatnot should be just left to their own devices, you know, and and not exploited as much because why pay attention to it? You know, it 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 doesn't take away from the character and it doesn't add depth to the character. To me, I think it just adds more of a distraction. All right, Ring. Uh, well, let's play the next message. We have two messages about Alan Scott, so I will play them together. The first is from Tom and the second is from Rich. Playing in three, two, one. Hey Myron and Phil. I wanted to put in my two cents on the Alan Scott situation. I personally have no issue one way or another with Alan Scott's sexuality. That being said, my question is what will the purpose be, or at least why the companies make such a big fuss over the change? I think you guys hit the nail on the head when you said pandering. Personally, I don't feel a person's sexuality is something to be focused on in a book or show. Not to say we should ignore it or pretend it isn't what it is. But in this day and age, it should just be considered normal not their whole identity. A few examples I talk to people about are from the CW-verse, Curtis Holt, Mr. Terrific, and Leonard Snart from Earth X, Citizen Cold. Both characters were gay but handled very differently. Kurt's character was much more than his sexuality, whereas Snart's whole character was to show up and almost be a stereotype or parody. 
If Alan Scott is going to be gay it shouldn't be the whole identity of his character. He should serve more purposes than that. I guess my two cents was more like a dime, but thanks for listening anyway. Keep your power ring charged. Myron. A little late but I just listened to the latest episode and wanted to weigh in on the Alan Scott topic that Phil brought up. Seeing how Alan Scott is my green lantern, when I first saw the news I was sorta shocked but then honestly thought I'll just be happy to see Alan on screen. Now as for Phil's point about viewers wanting to go back and read. Y'all have to remember that Earth 2 Alan Scott is gay, so they may be using that version of the character. Which would allow new viewers to go back and read. Alright Tom, well you know, um, you're right. I mean, it, it, it is pandering. Uh, why companies make such big fusses over changes, I, I, I don't think I'll ever know. Um, but a lot of it reflects back to the, to the, to the points I made uh, to Zach, uh, another listener. You know, I just feel like uh, it, it's an agenda, you know, it, it's, it's a, attaching a character to a specific topic point that highlights uh, a social group, you know, um, oh, this, this character is, uh, African-American, uh, this character is Asian, this character is, is gay, this character is transgender, you know, once you attach that specific point to a character, you automatically focus that character for the group's sake, and, like I said to, uh, earlier, to me, I think that should just be left alone. Um, yeah, sexual devices and a character or sexual orientation, to me, as, as a reader, I don't need to interpret it because it should already be there and it shouldn't take away from the characterization at all. What do you think, Myron? Well, you know, I, I agree. And, and, and to both uh, to, to, jo- to Tom's point and to, to Rich. Uh, you know, Rich comments that, that Alan Scott is his Green Lantern, but he's kind of honestly willing just to see Alan happy on screen. But at the same time, I'm sure it, it's it's not the character that he's known. And he brings up a topic about the Earth 2 Alan Scott. And I, I want to just talk a little bit about the sexuality of Alan Scott. Yeah, it's never really been a big part of the character. But remember that Alan Scott was married not once but twice. He mm-hmm. got married to, to Rose Canton, and that's where he had, where he had Jaden Obsidian as kids. And then he married Molly Maine, who was Harlequin, after Rose died. So you've got a history of a character who, if he was a closeted gay man, he got married twice. So you'd think after the first time and she died, he'd feel okay about coming out or he'd deal with it in a different way. It's not true to the essence of the character. And it's a case of let's change it for the sake of changing it to, as you said, Phil, to, to appeal to a demographic. Uh, mm-hmm. I just don't think it's necessary. And you know, one of the things that Rich talked about was, well, you remember the Earth 2 Alan Scott? And that's that series that uh, James Robinson did. It was 32 issues long. And I don't know if, if fans go back to look for Alan Scott material, will they look for that series? I don't know. You know, It's not the widely known version of Alan. And depending uh, on which, which version they do, I mean, I can't imagine it's not going to be the Earth 2 version of Alan Scott because they're focused on, on this being on Earth back in the 1940s. So I'm going to say it's going to be the classic Golden Age version of Alan. And if people go back looking for that content, not that they're necessarily going to, they're not going to see anything that lines up with what's in the in the, the show other than what appeared in the Green Lantern 80th anniversary issue where they, they hinted to that. And does it matter to me personally one way or the other? No, but I think it matters to lots of Alan Scott fans. You know, like I said earlier, if if – these characters are iconic enough to be used as source material for shows, then they deserve to be treated as such in the way that made them popular in the first place. They wouldn't be iconic if they weren't the characters they were. And every character, you know, the, the examples that, that Tom has with Mr. Terrific and, and Citizen Cold, um, you know, I, they were handled very differently. Um, I, I, I got to agree with him there. But every char- if every character is somebody's favorite character, they, they probably want to see that character in the way that they know them. And the way that they've that, that that character appealed to them in the first place, and for some, they may not care, but I think there's a, a significant portion that do. Uh, but you know, I hope it doesn't hinder the show in any way, and you know, they're going to do what they want to do. Uh, I, I'm just not, I'm not a big fan of changing characters. Just like I'm not a fan of of Guy Gardner suddenly being a father who's married. Uh, <laughs> that wow, you know, that's a departure. How, are they going to tone Guy down? You know the. the the fear I have is that they're going to make Guy the toxic ma- male character, the toxic, toxic masculinity character, and that's going to be his sole purpose is to be a punchline. Uh, and I guess I go back to because we don't know if there's going to be a Green Lantern movie. I, 
if this is what we're hanging our hat on, these aren't the characters I would choose. But again, that's just me. So, Power Ring, uh, why don't you go ahead and give us the next one. The last message is from Andrei Kuleshov from Russia. Andrei has much to say about a variety of topics. Ring Translator has been engaged. Playing in 3, 2, 1. Hello Phil and Myron. It's been over two years since I last wrote to you, but I never stop listening to your awesome podcast. I've started listening I think in 2014 when you and Bill were talking about Lego Batman, Beyond Gotham. I want to share with you some of my thoughts about the Green Lantern stuff. Phil, you have asked if you are the only one who liked the Larflees series. You are not, I also loved it, just like I love Justice League International by the same creative team. There were a lot of silly jokes, but there were a lot of great emotional moments as well. And I think that Grant Morrison's The Green Lantern series is just outstanding. His writing is very complex, but I don't think that it's a bad thing at all. I liked his Doom Patrol and Batman, and I like his Green Lantern even more. I can tell that he really cares about the continuity, and I can't imagine how many comics he has read to prepare himself before writing this series. I appreciate it even more because the Green Lantern mythos is probably the only thing in the entire DC Comics that still has almost all of its history unaffected by the Flashpoint in the New 52. I love that Grant Morrison constantly brings up things from the old Green Lantern comics. It's almost like he's rewarding us for reading comics from the Silver and Bronze Age. I love all of John Broom's stories, and because of that, issue 9 from the Green Lantern Season 2 is now my favorite issue of Morrison's run. Your podcast has definitely added a lot to my fan experience. For example, I didn't like Robert Venditti's Green Lantern series, but when he appeared on your podcast as a guest, I completely changed my mind about it. I was mad when he made Hal and Carol break up, but after listening to your podcast I understood why he made this decision. And he seemed very nice in general. Now I look fondly on his Green Lantern run and love his Hal Jordan and the Green Lantern Corps series. I wouldn't have enjoyed his run as much as I did if it wasn't for your podcast. And there were so many other great guests like Liam Sharp, or Jim Craig and John Carlo Volpe, and even Ethan Van, Skyver. It's very cool that you started reviewing early Jeff John's Green Lantern comics. I have also been rereading them not too long ago. The last time I wrote to you, I said that a publisher in Russia was translating and publishing Jeff John's Green Lantern run for the first time in this country. Unfortunately, it doesn't sell too well. But the publisher is very passionate about the Green Lantern, and because of that, they will keep translating and publishing it. Recently, we've got Blackest Night Absolute Edition. It's pretty cool. To promote the Green Lantern, sometimes this publisher gives away comics for free to the people who can answer some questions about very obscure Green Lantern stuff, and I won two or three times. So they've sent me some books and a poster. There is also another publisher that got a license to publish the young adult DC novels, and they've translated and published Green Lantern Legacy, but I did not care about that one. I think that it would be cool if you continued to revisit some of the stuff that came out before Jeff Johns. Last December you reviewed the Larflees Christmas special. If I can suggest some issues for the retro review, I think it would be cool if you reviewed some of the other Christmas specials. Green Lantern Mosaic Issue 9, Merry Mosaic, is a pretty good one. I read this one before Christmas every year. And Green Lantern Volume 3 Issue 36, The Ghost of Christmas Light, is also quite good. Thank you for all the things you do for the Green Lantern fans, I have always enjoyed your podcast and site. Andre, my friend, it is great to hear from you. Uh, I, I've been wondering how you've been uh, these last couple of years. I appreciate you taking the time to write such a great letter. And boy, you, you talked about a lot of stuff, but boy, I'm, I'm glad you did. You know, it's it's fun. You know, I, sometimes when I get down about doing some of this stuff, I, I remember people like yourself for whom you've come out and said, you know, this really, you know, your show is making it better for me as a fan. And, and to me, that's what it's all about, you know, and uh, even though you like the Laura Fleece book, but whatever. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I agree with you about the Grant Morrison thing. His writing is more complex and it does require some uh, intellectual investment, but I, I don't mind it. You know, I, I like to be my, have my mind stretched a little bit. I like to think about things a little bit. And at the same time, some of the stuff doesn't require that you know all the stuff that Grant Morrison is including in the meta. Uh, you don't have to necessarily know that stuff, but when you do it, it makes it kind of all the more interesting. So I agree. I, I love all the, like you, I love all the old John Broom stuff. Even though it's the, the goofy Silver Age mentality, it's fun. It's, it's mindless entertainment. 
And, and I appreciate your comments about the Robert Venditti uh, era of Green Lantern. And a lot of people were kind of put off by that a little bit. And I think Robert uh, is such a genuinely nice person. And I wish I could share some of the things that he told us off mic, but he, you know, he said, you know, I, I want to talk, you know, I want to talk to somebody about this kind of stuff, but I, I can't let it get out, you know, but some of the inside baseball stuff, uh, genuinely a nice person. And, and just because sometimes things aren't the way that we would want them in comics, it's not necessarily because of the writer, but maybe on restrictions put on a writer. Uh, all I'll say is, you know, if you're, if you start writing a story that's going to use certain characters and then you're told you can't use those characters for reasons X, Y, and Z, you suddenly have to stop, drop, and roll. Right. So anyway, uh, I, and I agree with you. I, I didn't like the fact that he broke up Hal and Carol. Uh, I, just because Jeff Johns left them, left them in such a good place, uh, it just seemed rather jarring. But uh, understanding what he where he was going, I, I get it. Uh, it just was difficult. And, and I appreciate you kind of calling out some of the interviews we've done. We haven't done any since Liam Sharp. Uh, and maybe we'll get Jeffrey Thorne on the show. Who knows? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I love the stuff you shared about getting the Green Lantern books over in Russia. And uh, f- obviously people listening to the show can't see the, the image that he sent. But Andre sent us a picture of the cover of Absolute Blackest Night. And it's in Russian, which was really kind of cool. Uh, it makes me want to try to collect some of these foreign language editions. Uh, but, you know, for him, for Andre, it's been a little difficult to get some of the Green Lantern books. So I appreciate the fact that he's been searching them out. Uh, it, it, really cool stuff. And I love his recommendations for the Christmas books. And I think, Phil, yeah. if you and I, uh, if we decide to do a third episode this month, because our next episode will be talking about the next issue of the Grant Morrison book, maybe we'll do a special Christmas episode. And do both of those issues. What do you think? Okay, I'm down for that. I think that'd be a good time. Because we got some time, right? What we're, we're looking at today's the eighth. Today's the tenth. Yep. So new issue comes out next week. Next week, and then the following week would have to be that'd be the week of of uh, Christmas. So we can either do it. Yeah, we can we can fit it in. We might be able to fit it in. We we we'll work over time because you know uh, Andre demands it. <laughs> and Andre deserves it, and I think what you should do is some justice and put that uh, Blackest Night cover on your the uh, website. Yeah, maybe I'll, maybe I'll attach it as an image to the to the the podcast episode, or I'll stick it in the when I when I publish the episode, I'll put a co- copy of the cover in there just for just for giggles. But I I think it'd be cool to do those two issues. I, I have forgotten about those, and I haven't gone back and reread them, so that that could be a lot of fun. Maybe we'll do a special Christmas episode. Mary Mosaic, I love it. Go him for bringing those out. Yeah, you know? yeah. You know, I think about those. That's what I love is, you know, there, there's so much rich history there. And, and I know you're 10 years younger than me, but as you get older, you start you start forgetting things. <laughs> that's true. You, you can't pull them out at your fingertips like you used to when you were younger. And I have forgotten about both of those issues. So, uh, But there's but there's one thing Andre said uh, that, that, uh, that touches my heart. And he's a Laura Flea's Christmas special comic book fan. Yeah, well, and like you, he likes he liked the Larfley series. I loved, I loved it. I thought it was great. I, I I just you know he's a he's a tragic character. You know he doesn't get his due, and he's kind of like the 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 Jar Jar Binks of the DC universe. You know, and that's okay. I'm okay with that because I didn't mind Jar Jar. A lot of people railed yeah. on him. My only problem with the series was was that it. It lost the edge. You know, he seemed to lose his edge a little bit. I like the fact that he was a tragic character, and uh, that in one minute he could be humorous, and the next minute he could be at your throat. And right. to me, the Larfley series just kind of went for the jokes and kind of left it at that. But yeah, you're eh, right. you know, whatever. You know, people, some people liked it, and that's obviously like Andre liked it. You liked it, you know. So maybe it's me. It, it could be, and I didn't make my Larfley's cookies this year. I need to get on that. I, I'm planning on doing it, probably not in time for Christmas, but in between the holidays. I'm taking that week off in between Christmas and New Year's. So I fully plan on making some Larfleeze cookies, just probably not in time for Christmas. Okay. I'm going to have to get on mine. We'll have to share our pictures of them and put them on the, put them on the website. <laughs> Andre, I'd send you some, but they'd take a while to get to Russia. They'd probably be crumbly <laughs> and they'd be green orange cookies <laughs> by the time they got there. <laughs> Well, we appreciate everybody taking the time out to share their thoughts with us. And Powering, why don't you go ahead and tell everybody how they can be a part of the show? You can become a part of the show by leaving a message up to one minute long on our voicemail line. Call us at 406 pod of oa That's 406-763-6362. 
You can also email us at podcast at blogofoa.com. We'd love to hear from you. This is Salak, Green Lantern of Sector 1418, and you are receiving the podcast of Oa. The podcast of Oa. All right, fellow Owens, and welcome back to another Know Your Core segment. And this one is brought to you by Corey, one of our awesome listeners, <clears throat> who brought to my attention uh, an, an underwater Green Lantern. And this one goes by the name of Lynn Kanar. Lynn Kanar is uh, the Green Lantern of Sector 1582. The first appearance was in Green Lantern Corps Quarterly, number three, in the winter of 1992. The character was created by Michael Jan Friedman, Dave Cochram, and Brad Vancata. Story goes The Green Lantern hailing from the ocean planet Fluvian. Lynn Kanar is a famed oceanographer specializing in underwater energy expulsion phenomena. As a result of one of Lynn's experiments, an underwater disease was unleashed, which quickly spread through the water. Lynn Kanar quarantined his home planet while he attempts to find a cure. And there you have it. And thanks, Corey, for bringing this one to my attention. I hope uh, you're listening out there, and, uh, and thanks for the recommendation. Lynn Kinnar, Green Lantern of Sector 1582 on your Know Your Course segment. All right, Myron. Well, when uh, when I texted you the other day, I said uh, we are recording this week, aren't we? And uh, I know we got another issue coming out next uh, next week, and uh, I, I but I knew that we needed to talk, and I knew that when you text me prior to that, there was a lot we needed to talk about. And here we are almost two hours in and, uh, another fantastic episode of, uh, of, of this podcast, man. I just, I loved it tonight. I had a great time. Yeah. Yeah. I had a good time too. And, uh, I, I think I kept myself reined in very well. Uh, I got a few snarky comments in here and there, <laughs> but that, that's just the way I handle things sometimes when, uh, I'm not too happy with, with certain things. But anyway, uh, we'll, we'll see how things progress as time goes on and hopefully I haven't ticked anybody off. And if I have, I am very sorry because unlike other people, I can be humble. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> snarky comment number 10. Yeah, that's right. That's right. That, that's how I roll. Uh, so anyway, we'll be back in about a week or so, so that we can talk about the Green Lantern Season 2, uh, the next issue, which is issue 10, I believe. Yep, issue oh, 10. Two uh, more, man. Yeah, we're, more. We're, wind, we're winding down, man. So we'll be back for that, and then hopefully, uh, time permitting, we're going to do a third episode this month. So that'll be our Christmas gift to you. All right, sounds great. All right, well, until next time, my friends. Uh, please be safe out there, treat each other well, keep that power ring charged, and make every day the brightest day you can make it. The Podcast of Oa is the official podcast of the Blog of Oa and a proud member of the Comics Podcast Network. Share your comments and questions by calling the show's voicemail line at 406 Pod of Oa. That's 406 763 6362. You can send your emails to podcast at blogavoa.com. You can also find the blog of OA and the podcast of OA on Twitter and Facebook. Green Lantern and other related characters are the copyrighted property of DC Comics Incorporated and are used without permission. The blog of OA and the podcast of OA are fan productions and do not claim any ownership over the Green Lantern or any other copyrighted properties. <laughs>